So excited to have Dr. Francois Nodia in studio with TPN today. We're going to be talking about uh, puppy module five of seven, sales and marketing. But Dr. Francois Nodia, I mean, you are a yeah. super, super teacher. teacher. You have to say it. You're like, oh, I'm a <laughs> super teacher. <laughs> Francois is legitimately a super teacher. You started your career in teaching. Um, and then you've pivoted, you've had your own businesses, um, you've done your PhD in eight months, and you have trained over 1,400 teachers around the country, all to be super teachers. I, my big mission is to get teachers to teach like superheroes. I love it. Thank you, Mitch. It's great being on, uh, on your show. Wonderful. So today, folks, we're going to be talking about um, Poppy, protection of personal information. As I said, we're doing module five of seven, and today we're going to do it on sales and marketing. Bonjour and I were talking um, a moment ago about a story um, and today's story is about, it's a real story, it happened about 10 days ago. Uh, a mom uh, met up with an ex-coach of a school um, in a mall, in the shopping mall. Um, the coach had taught her two girls, 13 and 14 year old girls, he taught them at a school um, and the coach had moved on to a different school and um, the mom then met up and this coach had pivoted his life into a, a business as well and she thought i'm going to support the business so she did the first transaction with the coach and the transaction went um, exceptionally well business transaction um, it involved um, um, sales and the transaction went exceptionally well so she then went and increased the size of her transaction and all of a sudden the wheels fell off the wheels fell off um, a, a week goes by, two weeks goes by, three weeks goes by, and the mom decides to escalate. It escalates on WhatsApp. Um, there's a conversation going down, and um, it becomes incredibly heated. The two of them calm themselves down um, and agree to, to re, re chat again on the Monday to solve the, the, the business um, transaction that, is, that has failed. In the meantime, it's a Friday evening, 5.30 in the evening, they exit WhatsApp. Two hours later, the daughter's phone, the 14-year-old daughter's phone, blows up. She is receiving images of herself on a website for pornography. Mm -hmm. It's a landing page. The image of the, of the daughter is an image that has been taken off Instagram, her Instagram profile. The mom doesn't know what to do. Um, come the Monday, this gets, I get included in a group of people to try and assist and help what has gone down here. Mm -hmm. It's now the Monday. The mom's having a look at the, inst at the, uh, the, the web page that's been created of her daughter, and it is a Wix web page. She then looks at the coach who's now doing a business transaction, sales transaction, and she looks at his invoice and it's got Wix invoicing on it. In her mind, she puts the two together. Mm -hmm. Folks, if you don't know, and I didn't know this, Wix is a really big company that supports 160 million customers yep. around the world, both on an invoicing as well as helping create templates for landing pages for business. Yep. In her mind, she has linked the two together. It's now escalating. I'm in this WhatsApp group and it's escalating. The coach is involved. Um, as it turns out, um, I jumped in at this point. We did some forensic analysis on what we could find on this particular web page. And as it turns out, and this is the point of the story, as it turns out, there is fraud syndicates that create bots that go into Instagram pages open Instagram pages, pull out pictures that support what they're looking mm. for, in this case, child pornography. They create template pages and they encourage people to come and open the page. What had happened is that the template page of the daughter had been used, exactly the same template, had been used on many different other pages. And so we had seen that it wasn't the coach. It was a bot, a fraud bot that had gone, mm. created template pages. She was just, her Instagram photo just mm. seemed to attract. So purely by coincidence, the two things happened in the same weekend. Purely by coincidence. I, I don't want to get involved in the whole f mm -hmm. um, technical um, analysis of what happened. Um, the conversation with the mom was, please, urgently, take the page down. You can go on to Wix. There is a button that says, take the page down because of 
and I'm not joking when I tell you, child pornography is one of the selections. Mm -hmm. Take it down for that, uh, that purpose. Look at the photo. We did some uh, reverse imagery. Has the photo been used anywhere else? No, it hasn't. Make the child's Instagram page private so that her um, friends and family that she wants to allow to see her Instagram posts see them, but it's not public for anyone to go and view it. And that's the story of the horror of social media and how it can be used in ways that we don't necessarily understand. Um, and it's not necessarily targeted. Her attack was not a targeted mm. attack. It was a much bigger attack that was just computer software that had used her photo. Ultimately, um, you enter the page, you put in your uh, an email, a name and a surname. This is what they're looking for. You go onto the next page because it's a free site. When you look at it, when you go onto the next page, they're asking you to input your credit card details. You go through all the different templates and you can see it was the same business with the same credit card, mm -hmm. with the same banking details underlying because that has to be displayed. So you can see what the business, what the company is. who had created um, all of these uh, pages by their disclaimer. They were looking for people's credit card details. And maybe they're not going to use your credit card details today but they're going to use your credit card details in six months in a year. Typically what they, they do is they don't steal from your, from your banking immediately. They, they steal from it later down the, down the day. And they were using the daughter's photo to encourage people to yeah. open this particular page. Horrifying. Absolutely. So one thing we need to remember is that more than 50% of the internet traffic is not human driven. A lot of these bots, a lot of these phishing scams on the internet is used to get people's credit card details or other information that can be used down the line. So especially now after lockdown and people, more people moving online, we're seeing an increase in these kinds of scams, these kinds of um, 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 internet traffic or bots and phishing scams arising. But now the challenge is, Mish, that we're not really in the business of knowing what the dangers on the internet is. We've been using the internet, We've, we know the wonders of the internet and the power that it has from an educational value, but at the same time there's a lot of dangers that we're not aware of and the pace at which these things are changing and adapting, it's almost impossible for us to stay up to date with that. Absolutely. So if we were to go back to sales and marketing from a school perspective, schools are using social media as part of their sales and marketing platforms. Mm -hmm. And we're using maybe our children's photos as part of that. So we, we want to talk about consent then. When is consent required to use children's photos and in what media would they be appropriate mm -hmm. to use that information? In, in the past, you used to have have your school magazine. Nowadays it's a school magazine, it's the online website. Um, it's taking pictures, um, I'm looking at maybe WhatsApp groups. So we have WhatsApp groups for different classes. Who's allowed to post on the WhatsApp group? Is it an admin only post or do you allow access to anyone to post um, on the group? Because say for example it's a, it's a class and parents are attending um, a soccer match, a rugby match, a hockey match, a swimming gala, and you take pictures, how do you prevent parents who have said, no, I don't want my child's uh, uh, picture posted on, um, on, on, on social media, and another parent takes a picture mm -hmm. and posts it on, on the group. With, with, with all good intentions in the world to say, well done team, here's a team picture, post it on the group, and then another parent takes that image mm -hmm. and then pops it onto the internet. Well, look, we're, we're talking about protection of private information or of personal information. And what we typically think of is things like ID numbers, telephone numbers, website addresses. But what we often forget is your likeness is most likely the most unique part of your of personal identity. So how do you even protect that? Now, in the past, it was kind of easy because you could say, don't take a photo of me. I don't want to be, it, there's, but with, with digital cameras, with um, media exploding the way it is, it's so easy for somebody to per chance get access to your, to your, um, your, your likeness. Exactly. Now, schools as the, as the protectors, because we, we do almost um, outsource the, the time that our kids or the safety of our children to schools when we send them out. Now, schools understand this for, for a long time. We are in charge of people's 
um, or the children's safety and the physical safety barriers are there. The, the gates are there. The walls are there. I mean, some schools have got security guards. But is that true of the, the online space or the digital space? Do we have firewalls in place? Do we have policies, um, social media policies, or how I like to call it your digital citizenship policies that protect the, um, the likeness of children? And also, as you said, the consent that parents give to my child's image may be used in the marketing of the school. So those kind of compliance is extremely important um, to keep track of because you can be audited on that. And then if something horrendous like this happens, how can the school say, well, you know, we weren't involved in this, but we did everything we can to protect the identity of that child um, on our service. So what I want to chat to you about also, Francois, is about um, super teachers. So we can talk about policy. We can talk about putting play, um, processes in place from a school um, perspective. But it filters down further because our super teachers um, are, have, have a direct relationship with the learners, with mm -hmm. the children. And how do we put in place conversations and learnings from um, administrators down into the super teacher environment that can then relate that information back into the classroom. It comes down to the school culture and I almost want to say the community culture around digital citizenship. So the, the role of the teacher isn't only to teach content. Mm. I mean, we've got a much bigger role than that. In, in actual fact, if you think that the role of a teacher is teaching content, those teachers will be replaced by the internet. The content is there, the kids can access the content. We've got a much larger role in f um, um, screening of content, um, on, on specifically individualizing content for the learner. Now, super teachers, and we use that term as the, the best of the best, the teachers that really have make an impact and want to make a positive difference in the classroom. We've got your child's interest at heart, the mm. best interest of the child at heart. They need to have the skills to integrate these very relevant things in the lessons that they teach. Any teacher can copy and paste a lesson off of the internet. They go and buy the lesson and they just parrot it in front of the class. That's not teaching. Mm. You need to take the context in which the children live. You need to understand the relevance of the content to them. Like understanding how you get the, them to pay attention in the first place is by using stories like this. Like this can happen to you. Now, how do we safeguard? How do teachers integrate lessons like this? Not only in the life orientation classroom where it's typically the, that's the place, but how do you build that into the computer literacy or the, um, the how do you build that into a science lesson? Mm. How do you find the integration between these points and you incorporate that in your lessons. So that is the trait of a super teacher. And what I've done is we've started a recruitment company called goteach.co.za where we, on behalf of the schools, screen for candidates that already have these characteristics, who already know that this is important for me to not just be a mediocre teacher. So we try and find those super teachers and then present those to the schools as these would be your top candidates because they already have these skills and you don't need to go and do extra training with them or spend your own resources in getting your staff to comply. But before you recruit, they're already comp compliant. What are, the, what, are, what are the traits of a super teacher, Francois? What are we looking for? So the traits of a super teacher, I mean, that's, that's vast. Um, but the, the three things that I believe that all super teachers have in common is number one, they get close. They understand the relationship, not only with them and the learner, because the re relationship thing has been um, spoken about quite a lot. But you really need to get close to the learner and their interests. Get close to your colleagues, because I think that's a massive thing that's lacking, is that we... We have these super teachers. We've got out, you know, we're in an island. We're, we're in the classroom and I am amazing. But I love what I call the, the Avengers effect. Go and find the other super teachers that you can form the Avengers with and then start collaborating. So you get close to your colleagues. Mm. The second thing I think all super teachers um, need to have is um, the fact that they know how to disrupt distraction. Kids can get distracted in the classroom very easily, especially now there are more distractions on second screens and third screens and opening multiple tabs. Super teachers know how to disrupt that distraction and pull the attention towards what the lesson should be and show the relevance. And then lastly, I think um, that super teachers, a trait of a super teacher is that they don't use catapults. 
Now, it's very, very arbitrary what I'm saying here, but uh, uh, a warlike discourse is not something we encourage in the classroom. Mm. Catapults are war machines. And if your teacher is a war machine in the way in which they speak, the way in which they act, they're not super teachers. What I rather want is somebody that's interested in launching the dreams of the kids into outer space. Our kids want to go to the moon. Mars. Our kids want to go they to Mars. They want to Mars. go to Mars now. now. Elon. Elon is driving we, the kids to Mars. Do we get them to Mars on the back of a catapult? No. no, it's a war machine. We'd much rather use technology, build rockets that can ha that thrusts them into the future, thrust their dreams, and make something a um, uh, 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 reality for them. Now, if a teacher can do those three things minimum, I call them a super teacher. Wow! So, and you've 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 trained one thousand four hundred. Super teachers. So at my time as a lecturer at the University of Johannesburg, um, in the time I was there, there was 1,400 students that uh, went through my hands and the hands of my colleagues, of course, because it's not a, a one-man show. So the other Avengers at the University of Johannesburg also assisted in that. But then also subsequently through my interaction on social media, the mastermind um, and all the other training um, I do with teachers, that's, that's how we try and instill the traits of a super teacher um, and showcase, listen, this is what um, the, the best entrepreneurs in our country, what they are saying about their teachers. Mm. Maybe there's something about that trait that they remember about their teachers that we want to replicate. So on the podcast that I have, that's called Super Teachers Unite. In that podcast, we interview business leaders, very prominent people in society and ask them, what did your favorite teacher, what did your best teacher do for you? What can you still remember from them? And of course, from that, teachers can learn a lot of lessons. Identify what my strength is and double down on that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Francois, some of the other thoughts that came to mind there is in terms of super teachers, the structure is quite important. So you've got your super teacher, they're in the classroom, they're communicating and connecting with their other colleagues, Avengers, they're communicating with the, the children, but overarching all of that are the policies and procedures um, in terms of how do we use data, when do we use data, in what environment can we use personal information. And I think if we can just pause for a moment, because in studio with us today as well is Peter Menon, our head of legal. And Peter's going to be taking us through um, the Poppy Portal module um, um, on sales and marketing. We've had some new developments in terms of our action plans, which Peter's going to take us through um, as well. So I want us to pause for a moment. We're going to hand over to Peter. Let Peter take our delegates through um, the, the modules on the Poppy Portal. Folks, do feel free, free to follow on with us. What we also has, have is we have the chat. So uh, live on the um, YouTube, if you want to log into YouTube, you will then be able to ask your questions and um, we will then answer those questions live on the chat. We're going to save some of the more general questions to the last 15 minutes of the Q&A for you and I. Then Francois, Peter and I can handle those questions that may come uh, through. Um, and lastly, if your screen is blurry, remember the cog down on the bottom right hand of the video. If you click on that, if you scroll over, mouse over the video, you get a little cog. If you click on the cog, change the settings quality. On the chat you can then click on that and we would appreciate if you gave us um, your um, your honest uh, feedback um, which will allow us to make improvements and know what to gear towards for the next uh, sessions in the meantime Peter Menon head of legal over to you thank you so much Dr. Nidia and Vishal for that enlightening conversation I'm here to take you through the TPN Poppy portal system today. I'm going to show you some new functionality. We're going to get started off with the left hand tab as we usually do, just to make sure you're set up on the system properly. And then we're going to go through the function of sales and marketing, going into the sub functions of both sales and marketing today through the formal presentation. Remember, Dr. Nodia and Michelle is going to be available for Q&A right after this formal section for 15 minutes where you'll also be getting your feedback forms, your feedback links, which you please need to complete for us. So let's run through the left hand tab and show you some new functionality on this system. 
First things first, please just make sure that you are set up correctly on the system. Remember the first time that you log into the TP and Poppy portal, you'll be asked certain questions that you need to answer for us. So once you do go into your settings, you'll notice how you've been set up through the portal. I've been set up as a private school. Um, you can see the company name as well as the company size and number of pupils or number of parents. Just click save on that so that your system is set up correctly. Remember also that your policies and procedures are available directly through the TP and Poppy portal. Once you click on that, uh, that uh, tab, it's going to open up all your policy documents for you as well as your other documentation ranging from your acceptable usage policies right through your retention and destruction policies and procedures. We are adding to this. There is around about six new policies and procedures which will come online during the next two weeks or so. So please have a look out for that. It's specifically your PIA manual as well as uh, some documentation relating to your information officer, their rights, responsibilities and duties. You can also add your staff members directly through that tab so you can access um, certain staff members directly off the system so that you can allocate certain work to them as well as including them in your action plans and meetings. Now the three new functionalities that has been added to the TP and Poppy portal system is the meetings, notes and action plans. The action plans has been updated, uh, the notes is a new functionality and the meetings is also a new functionality on the system. So once you click meetings you can go and add a specific meeting directly to the TP and Poppy portal and allocate who needs to be involved in that specific meeting. Say, for example, it's a monthly management review or it's a review of certain of the policies and procedures. Write a short description, the participants, which you're going to add, obviously, through your staff uh, function on the left hand tab and then the meeting date, the time and the end time. Should you click the start recording button button? Every action plan or action and note that you make on the system while the meeting is recording will be automatically allocated to that meeting as well. So you can see what actions and what notes came directly from that meeting. On your notes tab, you can go and click on that. You can go and add a specific note should you need to add a note to a specific subfunction. So say, for example, we're dealing with sales and marketing today. You need to increase security on your CRM system or on your server, your client relationship management system. Then you can click the indicator group. Let's say, for example, it's sales and marketing and write a short note on that as well as selecting the sub process indicator. So let's do that. You can go click on save and it's immediately going to add you a note. Remember, if you started recording on your meeting, this will automatically be added to your meeting as well as any action that you add to your action plan. I'm going to show you some different functionality of this as well. Once we do go through the sub processes, please take note of this. You can go and add actions as well as notes directly to the sub processes while you're going through it. So it's going to add a lot of viability to the system once you start getting into the nitty gritty of how to be poppy compliant through these sub processes. Let's head directly into your personal information impact assessment that you have been following with us through the last few training sessions on the TP and Poppy portal. Once I click impact assessment and overview, it's going to give me an overview of all the functions that I have already completed and the functions and sub functions that I still need to complete. So as you see, we've got our governance function, our finance function, our human resources, information technology, operations, legal and sales of marketing. We are going to go through the sales and marketing function today. Click on review all indicators and you can see that we've got both sales and marketing available for us to review. I'm going to review sales first and then move into marketing thereafter. So click the review button. If you're following with me through the TP and Poppy portal system and you've already logged in and you're watching the video while you're going through this, please, it is quite uh, easy to do this and just take note that you need to answer these questions in context to your own business as well as what's currently busy happening through your sales and marketing sub processes. So the sales function usually becomes operational after the potential clients has been identified and normally includes a list of prospective clients and even a CRM system. 
Usually there are high volumes of personal and identifiable information in this area. Once again, we're going to use our case study to go through both the sales and marketing sub processes. So general information, select the accountable person, myself, the progress status is assigned and let's choose today's date as the date that we need to um, perform the sub function by. Click on save. As you'll probably have noticed, when I click the save button right over there, there was another button that we have included in the TPN Poppy Portal system. Because for many of you, for many of our schools, certain of these sub functions are not going to be applicable to their business. Specifically, having a look at the governance sub function, including Mancos, board of directors, etc. So once I click on the edit button and I go into the system, the first thing that I can go and do is mark the subsection or sub function as not applicable, meaning that the sub function is not prevalent at the school or at the organization, and therefore you don't need to run through the personal information impact assessment on this sub function. So that's also available for you right now. But for today's date, we are using a school that obviously does sales and marketing. So we're gonna mark that as applicable. We're gonna select the accountable person, progress status, and the due date. Let's start by asking ourselves questions on the personal identifiable information that we are processing through our sales sub function. So the volume of personal information being processed in this function, most probably for you or for any of our schools here today, is going to be quite high. Our case study also selected high. Once again, if you're unsure what these terms mean, like personal information, special personal information, information regarding European Union citizens or the GDPR, these wiki links are available to you as well. I'm gonna click through three of them right now in this personal identifiable information category so that you can see how these work. Let's go through personal information, special information, and personal information on European citizens. So once I go and click through these wiki links, they will open up a TPN wiki tab for me. So sensitive personal information is information that can identify the data subject. This can include information such as data subjects, ID numbers, bank account details, tax numbers on individuals and juristic entities. Special personal information, once again, defined in section 26 of the act, and it includes a data subject's race, uh, pregnancy status, national, ethnic, or social origin, um, physical or mental health, medical history, criminal history, biometric information. And also on the GDPR or European Union citizens category, we can go and click on that. And it's going to tell us that the General Data Protection Regulation is a legal framework that sets guidelines for the collection and processing of personal information from individuals who live in the European Union. So quite simple, just having a look at those wiki tabs. Then I can go back into my TP and Poppy portal and start that personal information impact assessment. Does the information, the personal information that I'm processing through my sales sub function include sensitive personal information, which means ID numbers, bank details, etc.? It most certainly will. Does it contain special personal information? Most probably not. Our case study also marked no. Does it contain information regarding children? Possibly. Our case study actually selected yes on this question. Does it contain personal information on European citizens? Quite possibly yes as well. And click the save button. Remember that save functionality. If you're busy like everybody else um, and you've just gone through the system and uh, you sort of want to stop at a certain point, remember to click the save button because you'll be able to access the system where you left off once you exited the TP and Poppy portal system. The information and where it is processed, I've already included this for us. We are keeping sales personal information through our server and CRM or client relationship management system. It's both paper and electronic and the level of access control is high. Control measures that are in place and this is what our case study selected. They said that they've got policies and procedures in place. They've got certain checklists in place. They are both using electronic access control and physical access control and there is monthly reporting on their sales processes and the personal information that's shared through this sub function. Click save. The important questions relate directly to the eight pillars of lawful processing in terms of poppy and how these must be allocated to these questions that you're asking yourself contextually 
on your sales sub function on the information that's being processed. So once again, you can go and click on these wiki tabs. I'm just going to access two of those for us. The first one being whether the processing of personal information is taking place lawfully. Once again, having a look at the eight pillars of lawful processing in terms of Poppy. And then finally, we are going to have a look at the consent wiki as well. So once I click on those, it's going to open up those TP and wiki links for me. In terms of Poppy, there's eight pillars of lawful processing that needs to be taken into consideration when we're processing personal information. These include accountability, processing limitation, purpose specification, further processing limitations, information quality, openness, data subject participation, as well as security safeguards. Consent requirements in terms of our wiki also says that personal information may not be processed without consent unless any one of the factual scenarios in section 11 of Poppy is applicable. If any of the factual scenarios is present, consent is not needed. The factual scenarios include if it is required to conclude or perform a contract, the party processing the information is required to do so by law, the processing protects the legitimate interest of the consumer, the processing is necessary for the performance of a public law duty, or it is done in pursuit of the legitimate interests of the responsible party. Now, most probably with your sales and marketing sub function, please go and have a look at the previous video that we did um, with um, um, the CEO um, of the, the Direct Marketing Association of South Africa, um, David Dickens, specifically talking about um, direct marketing and how you can market to clients as well as non clients through the current copy regulations and legislation. Very important one to go and have a look at for the schools and organizations that is perhaps marketing and selling products through normal channels as well as through email communication, etc. Go and have a look at that video. It's going to explain a lot to you and open up the world to you of direct marketing in your organization. Heading back into the TP and Poppy portal, we can go click over there and start answering these important questions in terms of Poppy. Is the processing of personal information taking place lawfully? Once again, having a look at our case study, they selected yes. Is the processing of personal information done in a reasonable manner? Also yes. Have you applied the rule of minimality? Yes, they had done so. Is the collection of personal information being done for a specific and explicitly defined purpose? Yes, it is. And have you obtained consent from all data subjects in this area where it is considered mandatory according to the Act? Very important when you're having a look at your sales and marketing and how you're marketing the school to prospective clients to go and have a look at that video that Michelle and David Dickens did specifically on direct marketing and what you can do and what you cannot do. Our school selected yes on this category as well and clicked save. The data usage questions also takes into consideration the eight pillars of lawful processing in terms of poppy. So let's just run through these. Do you notify the data subject as required by Poppy when collecting personal information? Case study selected, yes. Has the retention and restriction of records been formalized in this area? They marked partially. Is personal information in this area used for another purpose? They said that it is not used for another purpose. Have you ensured that personal information in this area is updated on a regular basis? They selected yes on this. And are you satisfied that the appropriate security measures are in place to ensure confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the personal information? As they had already implemented a policy and procedure on this, they selected yes, they are happy with their process and clicked save. Now, one of the new functionalities through the system that you'll almost see automatically is this button down at the bottom. You can now go and add notes as well as actions directly on the sub process through this button. So let's say, for example, we are taking, has the retention and restriction of records been formalized in this area? Our case study marked partially, so they need to go and relook most probably at their restriction and uh, destruction of records and how it's been formalized and implemented. So let's take that as an example, click on that button over there, and we can go and add an action plan relating directly to this. So we can go and mark, say for example, we need to review our retention and destruction policy and procedure. Go and write the title, due date, the task priority status, the linked persons and actions. And automatically that's going to be added to this specific sub process on sales for me. We can also go and add a note 
directly on the system and it's going to allocate that note to the sub process. So very easy now to go and add your action plan while you're going through your personal information impact assessment, just adding new functionality to the system to make it simpler for you to utilize the system as you go through your personal information impact assessment. For now, I'm going to close that and we are going to run through the marketing portion of the sub process. So once I've done this, we can go and have a look at our inherent risk, our residual risk and our behavioral risk. Obviously, our inherent risk, depending on how I have now gone and answered these questions on the volume of personal information and the information that I'm actually busy processing through the sub function, we can see how we've answered those questions. We said it's a high volume of personal information. We're collecting both sensitive personal information as well as information on children and European citizens. So we've got inherently a high risk with the information being processed. There's low residual risk as a result of the control measures that we've implemented. And there's low behavioral risk as a result of us applying the eight pillars of lawful processing in terms of poppy with that question or those sub processes for your sales. In terms of marketing, we can go and click on the review button once again, and it's going to open up a very similar tab. And now we need to answer questions on Poppy on our marketing sub process. The marketing function can include the use of social media and other marketing avenues. This can also include advertising. Usually there is some personal information in this area, but usually in low volume. So let's answer that in this context. The accountable person, myself, it is assigned and we are selecting the same date and mark as save. Once again, that not applicable button is available to you directly when you access your sub process and click save. Personal identifiable information, we're not going to go through these wikis again. We've already done so. You can also go and access those just by clicking on the information tab. Volume of personal information being processed. We're going to mark this as low in accordance with how we've just read the marketing descriptor. Does it contain sensitive personal information? Yes, it does. Does it contain special personal information as defined by Poppy? Most probably not. Our case study selected no. Does it contain information regarding children? Also not. And does it contain personal information on European citizens? Possibly your database could include information on European citizens. Our case study selected yes on this question and clicked save. The information and where it's processed, also the same as where we go and capture all the personal information in terms of our sales sub-process on our server and CRM system. Very possibly both paper and electronic and the level of access control also selected as high. Control measures that our school had in place already. They said they've got policies and procedures in place. They've got certain checklists in place when it comes to their marketing lists, electronic and physical access control. And also, once again, they have got monthly reporting on this sub process and click save. Important questions, eight pillars of lawful processing in terms of Poppy. Not going to go through those wiki links. They're available to you through those wiki tabs. Is the processing of personal information taking place lawfully? Yes, it is. Is the processing of personal information done in a reasonable manner? Also, yes. Have you applied the rule of manimality? Our case study selected, yes. Is the collection of personal information being done for a specific and explicitly defined purpose? Yes. Have you obtained consent? Also, yes. And click save. Data usage questions. Do you notify the data subject as required by the Poppy Act when collecting personal information? Our case study selected, yes. Has the retention and restriction of records been formalized? Once again, they marked partially. Is personal information in this area used for another purpose? No, it is not. Have you ensured personal information in this area is updated? They selected yes. And are you satisfied that the appropriate security measures are in place? They also selected yes on that question and clicked save. Remember that functionality is now available to you. You can click on the button right down at the screen uh, where my mouse cursor is at and you can go and add your actions and notes once again like I showed you in the previous sub process. Once I go through into my sales and marketing function, it is going to op update that accordingly. As we're collecting some sensitive personal information in terms of the sub process, my inherent risk is medium. My residual and behavioral risks are though low because of the control measures that I'm put in place for my residual risk and on my behavioral risk, I've answered those questions in terms of Poppy, the eight pillars of lawful processing 
in the affirmative and made sure that I'm applying those specific eight pillars to the processing of this personal information in terms of my sales and marketing function. That brings us to a close of our formal section for today. I'm going to hand back over to Dr. Francho Nadia as well as Michelle to take us through the Q&A section for today's webinar. Wonderful, thank you so much, Peter, for that um, showcasing of the Poppy uh, system, of the Poppy portal. Folks, I think we're gonna head into questions and answers uh, now. Peter's going to facilitate those that have been popping up on the chat. Please do feel to continue sending those questions through. We've also posted the feedback survey link, so do click on that and give us your feedback. Francois, what I wanna to talk to you a little bit about is from a practical perspective. Mm -hmm. Practically, how do learners, how do um, educators, how do we protect our identities on social media? So I think there's, there's two aspects to this. First of all, the responsibility from the school side is to give guidance. So if your school doesn't have a digital citizenship policy, what many schools call a social media policy, but I think it's it stretches further than just social media. So if your school doesn't have a policy in place on how we ensure digital citizenship or the, the, the increase of digital citizenship or the um, you know what the school desires, our actions online in a digital space should be, I think the school need to have something like that in place. And then secondly, um, we need to start educating ourselves on what is good behavior, what is safe behavior in a digital space. Now, I mean, we don't have enough time to go through everything. Now, it depends on the platform. It depends on your unique context. So there are a lot of other curriculums that people can work through. And I think the one of, one of the ones I like the most is um, Google's curriculum on digital citizenship. It's called Be Internet Awesome. So you can just pop onto Google and go and look for it, like Be Internet Awesome. It's it's so cool because it's, it's presented like a gamified type of system. You can work through the curriculum. Um, I think it's focused on like senior phase, like grade seven, eight, and nine, but I mean, earlier phases can do it as well. And our teachers should definitely go through that curriculum. Um, because it, it does showcase good practice on social media or on digital spaces. I mean, we wouldn't just give our credit card information away like easily. And, but that's something because it touches our pocket. Now we're very careful about it. But like your likeness on the internet, how do you protect that? And I think using resources like this is very important for us to upskill ourselves and realizing how we can remain safe online. Fantastic. We've got some questions coming through. So Peter, I'm going to ask you if you could just um, pop those across to us. Thank you, Michelle. Um, first one is from Karen. I have a query regarding the information regulator and Annex to C of the forms. Please could someone from TPN assist, which we will obviously do after this session. Your portal has been so helpful with policies, impact assessment, etc. Many thanks. But I think this question relates to the information regulator and registering information officers at right. this point so, in time. Right. So thanks, Peter. And thanks for that question. As you know, that you have to, um, all businesses, all organizations must register their information officer with the regulator. The requirement was by the 1st of May. The portal at the information regulator is not yet live for you to uh, register your information officers at the moment. There is a um, hard copy document that you can fill in an email to the regulator, but I do believe they've been inundated and they um, have pushed back and said, please just use the online portal, which is not yet live. We will let you know as soon as it is live. We are checking it every day. Um, as soon as it is live, we will post out to all of our clients and let them know. In the meantime, the regulator has published that the requirement to register is by the 1st of July. So we've still got a lot of time um, to actually register, register your information officer with the regulator. And as you know, the information officer at the organization must be of an executive level or management management uh, level, someone that can implement change within the business. Um, so it is somebody at exec or management level that uh, needs to uh, be appointed. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Nisha has asked, I would like to know when will the risk management and compliance manual be released? I'm thinking this is in relation to FIC perhaps or in relation to the TP and Poppy portal. So perhaps speak about both of those for so us, So the risk management and compliance manual is available from a FICA purpose. Um, it is on the lease pack um, uh, documents, which is available on the TPN shop. And um, you're able to go and download that um, immediately. So it is on the lease pack on the shop. 
Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Kate has also asked, what does sales with relation to personal information in the context of a school include? Oh, Francois, this is a great one mm. because we can address this practically from both the private and a public school uh, perspective. Sales and marketing within the school context. How do how do how does a public school market themselves versus mm. a private school? And then we'll talk about the personal information. So uh, private schools, of course, have got a different agenda than the public schools necessarily have. The demand for public schools, I mean, there's a great demand and not enough supply, so the schools are full. Um, that's the major issue that the government is struggling with. We don't have enough schools, so it's easy finding people for the, to, to, to get to into fill, the school, to, to fill, fill the school, yeah. but um, not necessarily the, the, when it comes to fee-paying schools, you're not sure whether you um, are enrolling parents who can afford schooling. I mean, that's a whole kettle of fish that we don't necessarily want to dive into. But from a private school uh, point of view, I mean, that's, that's how you get your funding. Um, so sales and marketing for a private school is very different than it typically is for most fee-paying um, public schools. And I think the, the challenge is a lot of uh, private schools think that by doing the the, the, the general or the, the medium things like um, have a billboard or have a website is enough when it isn't. What people are attracted to are stories. People want to see the story of your school. We try and showcase um, this sports result or children achieving when at the end of the day we need to showcase what the school is doing to foster an environment of excellence. Now, many schools fall in the trap of using the likeness of children in the schools in their marketing, which uh, is a major, major challenge as we've just discovered. So finding the, the, the interesting ways in marketing your school's values, marketing the school's story is going to be interesting. Absolutely. And if you, don't, if, you, if, you, if you don't innovate in this, if you don't start using the digital platforms that exist, um, where your target audience is or the target market is and you don't start regularly like I would say a show like this or a podcast or, or something where you can showcase the values of the school is extremely important for every single school. 100% and so who, let's talk about Poppy for a moment, who can you market to and how do you market mm. to them? Well in terms of Poppy we now have an opt-in requirement. So in the past your sales and marketing you could market to people and um, all that was expected of you was to have an opt-out clause and people that didn't want to receive your communication could then opt out mm. of receiving your sales and marketing. Now it's an opt-in. So uh, organizations need to build for themselves a database of people that they can um, uh, uh, market to and those people have to have opted into that database in order for you to have uh, that conversation with them. Of course so it's consent driven. Of course there are some caveats to that in terms of direct marketing. The first caveat is that in terms of um, Poppy, telephone calls are not direct marketing. So you don't have to um, get consent and have an opt-in clause if your intention is just to make a phone call for somebody from a mm -hmm. direct marketing perspective. Um, if you are marketing to them, you can send out a um, opt-in clause first. So if you have a database of people that you want to communicate to, say you've got a feeder school, and your feeder school wants to provide you a database of people that you maybe want to market your um, high school to, as an example, or you have um, um, nursery schools that feed into your, uh, your primary school, you need to then first ask the person their consent to market to them. Mm. So the first communication is we're um, communicating from school X um, and we'd like to share some um, information about our school do you want to opt in or opt out um, at that point? The challenge though is that the market is flooded with these kinds of um, initiatives. Mm. So the, the, the one night stand type of marketing, the fly by night marketing doesn't work. If you do not provide value to the audience that they can receive for free, why would they want to consume your marketing material? So if you go from a selling point of view, and this is what our school offers and come in, but enroll your kid in our school because and 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 and, People are inundated with information like that. So you have to be different. You have to be unique. And the way in which you do that is you know your audience. It's extremely difficult to do that. But getting information on knowing what is uh, of interest to your community will allow you to create content that's of value. You provide the value first and then you say, by the way, we also offer this. Yes. So that the people want to opt in into your messaging because you're providing value. 
I love that. It's all about value, um, Francois. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the sales aspect and the sales component mm -hmm. of it. But I see we only have two minutes left. Um, are there any other questions that are coming up? I'm going to try to group two of these questions together and then there is a final one. Okay. For you. Okay. So Carol has asked regarding the use of likeness of a child and consent from the parent. Do you have guidelines for drawing up this agreement? And the second one, if you don't associate details such as name, age of child with their likeness, is there less risk involved? Right. So um, a couple of things. Um, biometric information. Biometric information is, um, firstly, personal information is your identity. Um, your name and your surname, your address, your telephone number, that kind of thing. Then you have special um, personal information, which is your biometrics. And your biometrics would be your DNA, your blood, your fingerprints, your face. Right now, in terms of doing credit assessments on people, you can do a credit assessment on a person simply by doing facial recognition. So you come in and you say, we're going to do a photo of someone, they're going to send a photo of themselves, and we're going to go off to Home Affairs, we're going to get a picture of their photo, and we're going to match and say that that is the same person. That is using likeliness already simply on your face. So now I would say that that is special personal information already. Then we take it one level further and say children's information has an even higher level of protection than um, simply personal information or special personal information. So taking photographs of children is absolutely um, very, very protected and likeliness. So just posting their picture without their name and surname would still, in my mm. mind, equate to uh, personal information that needs to be uh, protected. That type of information, Francois, you would need consent. So those, the schools should have these type of consents in place on an annual basis, not just the child entering the school. Absolutely. And I mean, just protect yourself in this case. What does the, the face of the child really mean for your marketing? It doesn't, that individual's face doesn't do much for portraying the story you want to tell. So eliminate that risk fully. Blur out faces as best you can. Use emojis over those faces or just take pictures rather of a group of children from the back, from behind. Or, or have consent because some parents are okay with, um, with consent and it's a personal choice um, after, um, after all. Um, Peter? Michelle, that is done for today. Thank are we so done much. for today? Yes. And we're right on time. Francois, you are a super teacher. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> That's been amazing. Thanks, folks.